welcome. This is Shani Pierre, and I'm the director of the Maison Francaise of Columbia University. Um, we're particularly delighted to welcome all of you today for this discussion with Etienne Baliba about the first two volumes of his com complete works, Oeuvre Complète, which were recently um, published. I'm not Oeuvre Complète, but I'll explain that later. Okay, okay. <laughs> So, um, on behalf of the Maison Française and our co-sponsors at Columbia, which are the Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Theory, the European Institute, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, the European Union and the Alliance Program, as well as the Columbia Global Centers in Paris, we're delighted to, to welcome all of you. Etienne Balibar is, in a, a sense, a, a member of, of the family at Columbia, and specifically the French department and ICLS. And he's been teaching here in the fall for the last uh, several years. We can't have him with us in person this year, but we thought that it would be wonderful to um, invite him to join us from Paris to speak with several of his dear colleagues and friends here at Columbia about these first two volumes of his apparently not complete works, and he'll explain that to us in a moment. So um, thanks to all of you for joining us. There will, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or um, yes, a Q&A button. So feel free to submit a question, either in French or in English, at any time through the broadcast. There will be a, a time for questions at the end of, um, at the, end of the, the presentations. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much to Etienne Balibar, Suli Malbashir Diane, Bernard Arcourt, and Emmanuel Sada for being here with us. I now turn over to Suli Malbashir Diane, who will um, give some introductory remarks and introduce our speakers. Thanks. Let me unmute myself. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Shani, and uh, thank you to you, to Fanny, and to the Maison Francaise for organizing this important event. Uh, good afternoon to all of you who are uh, following us uh, on the East Coast, where we are. Uh, good evening to you, uh, Etienne, and everybody who is following from, from the other side of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, um, uh, let me uh, change a little bit the, the rules and not uh, introduce Etienne uh, in a classical way, reading a bio bio-bibliography that all of you uh, know about and uh, do it in a, in, a, in a different way. This event, as uh, Shani just mentioned, uh, looks very much like a book launch, the occasion being the recent publication of Etienne Balibar's Écrit 1 and Écrit 2, Writings 1 and Writings uh, uh, 2. The first Écrit uh, uh, bearing the title in English, let me uh, translate this, and I'm not proposing this title for uh, uh, the, the translator in English to come. Open-ended history from a century to the next. Uh, Histoire interminable d'un siècle de l'autre. And not d'un siècle à l'autre in, in, in French, which is a very Céline way of uh, saying things. Céline is the one who popularized this way of just eliminating the A ah, to say d'un siècle l'autre. And Ecri uh, writings to uh, passions of the concept, epistemology, theology, and uh, uh, politics. And um, these are wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, books. The cover already is wonderful, and I'm happy that Etienne himself is happy with the, with the cover. So I have said that this event looks like a book launch because those very titles, uh, uh, Écrit 1, Écrit 2, to be followed uh, soon, uh, hopefully soon enough, uh, by Écrit 3, Écrit 4, Écrit 5, and Écrit 6, indicate that uh, beyond a, a simple book launch, we are actually celebrating here this afternoon, this evening, the work also open-ended and terminable of one of the most important philosophers of our times. 
I use impression not as a word of praise, although there are so many things to be to praise uh, HN4, uh, but as a fact, uh, that is to say, a description, a sheer description of the nature of HN Balibar's interventions on the challenges, the questions, the issues, all of them planetary that we are facing uh, uh, in our times. A few years ago, I was among the participants of an international conference in Paris, organized around the question, why Balibar matters. The French title was Pourquoi Balibar? And the proceedings have been published under that title in 2015. And this very event that we are now sharing, this conversation we are sharing, reminds me of that conference in Paris. First, because these two volumes of writings uh, uh, published by HN tell us eloquently why Balibar matters but also because he had, during that conference, to be present, sitting in the back of the conference room, trying to pretend that he was not there. And today, uh, uh, again, you are submitted to the same kind of trial. You could just turn off your video, although we all want to see you. We also, we, the participants, the, the contributors to the conference, had on that day to pretend that Etienne was not there listening to us. We were philosophers coming from the US, from Portugal, from Belgium, from France, of course, and uh, other places. And we were expressing in our presentations how much Etienne's oeuvre matters as it enlightens important issues of our time, how much it matters to our own reflections, uh, also as we presented them that day, and above all, how much Etienne himself, he as a person, mattered for many of us. Because, and this is something that needs to be said in this introduction uh, of Etienne Baliba, uh, uh, Shani has mentioned that for the last uh, six years, we have been fortunate to have Etienne uh, with us as a colleague at Columbia University, and above all, as a, as a, as a friend. And uh, this man, Etienne Balibar, has an inexhaustible sense of friendship. And this is also something we celebrated during that conference, and this is also something we want to celebrate uh, 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 now here in this event. About Etienne's sense of friendship, I must say, uh, Bernard Arcourt has himself beautifully uh, spoken, and he might want to say that uh, again, he, as he is the first speaker. But before introducing uh, Bernard for his presentation and giving him the floor, let me just say uh, uh, two things here. First thing, I am going to quote uh, uh, Etienne Balibar himself, in a way, introducing himself and introducing these two books. This is what Etienne said in a recent interview. As a citizen and an activist, I have felt the need to confront the history of which we are a part. I just found that that one sentence summarizes uh, what Etienne has been doing in these two uh, uh, books and in the books to, 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 to follow. Uh, uh, confronting the history of which we are part is what led him to the interventions uh, uh, presented here on an important number of questions. And by the way, the word interventions is a chance word himself in the introduction he wrote for Ecrit uh, 1. And uh, uh, many of those questions are addressed in Ecrit 1 and Ecrit 2. Uh, they are all questions related to our times that can be described at the time of global capitalism of today. And Etienne explains in, uh, in his Ecri uh, that we are, this uh, time of capitalism is a time of what he calls absolute capitalism. 
to characterize uh, the current moment of capitalism as capitalism has become now, I quote him, post-socialist, post-colonial, and extractive. We are dealing with an extractive, post-socialist, post-colonial capitalism, absolute capitalism as he calls it, and this is somehow the general frame within which Etienne is raising the question here, the questions he raises in uh, uh, writings one and writing two. And also uh, uh, the frame is also uh, given by the fact that according to him, we are living right now, according to him. We, we all know that uh, if we are uh, um, paying attention to science and not to uh, politics only, uh, that we are living in this time of environmental catastrophe. And Etienne shows how this time of environmental catastrophe also will play a crucial role in the reconstruction of socialism in the 21st century. I believe that these two aspects give really the general frame of his writings, addressing the general issue of absolute capitalism and addressing the environmental catastrophe uh, that we are living in and with the perspective of a reconstruction of socialism for the 21st century as a response to those two uh, aspects. And he deals in this entry with planetary politics of cosmopolitanism of Europe, the question of borders, the new practices of citizenship and civility, a very important issue in Etienne, uh, Etienne's thought that he developed in a, in a previous book, uh, uh, violent, uh, Civilité et Violence, or Violence et Civilité, I don't remember which is the, the order. And uh, uh, that's a very con uh, important concept also here. I have a short question for you, Etienne. Uh, if you wanna address it while you are responding to Bernard and, and, and Emmanuel, but uh, you, you don't have to because they are the, the ones who are going to comment on your writings and you will have to respond to them. I but will. In, in, in the course of your response, you can uh, uh, come back to uh, something that I find very important that you mentioned, uh, because I know you and I are in a group where we are reflecting on the importance of the construction of Europe and the significance of Europe in this uh, world of us. The role assigned to what you call an alter globalizing Europe. So if you have a, an opportunity while responding to Bernard and Emmanuel, please uh, 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 do. And I believe that is also something important in the reconstruction of socialism in the 21st uh, uh, century. So uh, that was my introduction to you. So nothing about your bio or your biblio, but everybody knows about your bio and your biblio. So now allow me to introduce the, 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 the speaker who is going to uh, uh, go in depth in uh, um, HN's writing, uh, uh, our friend and, and colleague, Bernard Arcou. Uh, uh, Bernard is the Isidore and Sevi Sulzbacher, I hope you pronounce it Sulzbacher, professor of law and professor of political science uh, at Columbia University. And he is also uh, a chair professor at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Uh, uh, Bernard Arcourt just published very recently a, a, a book, Critique and Praxis, in which he explores the relationship between uh, critical theory and political practice. And this is in continuity with his other writings in which he examined modes of governing in our digital age, especially in our uh, post 9-11 uh, uh, world. Uh, he is also the author of uh, The Counter-Revolution, How Our Government Went to War Against Its Own Citizens, uh, and also another book, Expose Desire and Disobedience in the Digital uh, Age. Uh, uh, we have followed many of us here uh, at Columbia and around Columbia, uh, to the, belonging to the Columbia uni uh, community at large, have been following uh, the conversations organized by Bernard around uh, Michel Foucault's, uh, the publication of Michel Foucault's lectures at the Collège de France. And he has edited uh, uh, the volume in, of La Société Punitive, and Théorie, Théorie et Institution 
panel as well. And he is also the editor of the new player edition, edition of Surveiller et Punir in the collected works of Foucault. He is also, this needs to be said, uh, because it is important. Bernard Arcourt is a passionate advocate for justice. He started his legal career uh, representing death row inmates, working with Brian Stevenson, in particular, at what is now the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. And he is the recipient of the 2019 Norman Redbush Capital Defense Distinguished Service Award from the New York City Bar Association for this long-term advocacy on behalf of death row prisoners. So uh, 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 Bernard, uh, the floor is yours. Bernard, you need to unmute. Unmute yourself. We still can't hear you, Bernard. I'm I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, this is fine. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Bashir, for that generous introduction. Bonsoir, Etienne. Uh, bonsoir, Emmanuel. Thank you, Shani, for organizing this. In the first footnote to the first volume of his collected essays, Etienne Balibar reminds us that for Freud, analysis, even completed analysis, is never ending and has no terminal point. Un endliche analyse in German, analyse infinie ou interminable in French, or we could say, and Bashir here, maybe we'll have a conversation, possibly open-ended, as you were suggesting, but I would prefer unending uh, or infinite, um, and also not interminable because it has a, a negative connotation, but rather unending. And of course, Balibar reminds us that his teacher, Louis Althusser, borrowed that formulation to describe history uh, in a foreword he titled Histoire terminée, Histoire interminable. Now, in a similar homage, uh, Balibar places his first volume under the same sign uh, of his friend and teacher, Althusser, uh, but retains only the second half of that title. Uh, history has no ending. History has no terminal point. And by contrast to those who have described or predicted the end of history, Balibar underscores how essential it is to keep open future futures of revolution, of successions of revolutions and insurrections in order to keep alive alternative utopias, especially the idea of socialism. Balibar makes this most clear in the very final sentence of the final paragraph of the final essay of that first collection, which I'll come to later. But it's not only history that is without end in these two spellbinding volumes. It's friendship and loyalty, as Bashir mentioned. Etienne Balibar's fidelity to his inter intellectual interlocutors and his companions, past and present, radiates through every page and passage of his writings. A fidelity of thought and persistent rhythm of thinking and rethinking with his friends and companions, interlocutors, those so dear to him, Althusser, Foucault, Deleuze, Canguillem, among those who left more recently, Marx, Spinoza, Pascal, Machiavelli, uh, among those who left us long ago, um, but also those who are here today, uh, Pierre Macheret, Emmanuel Terray, uh, Mario Tronti, Tony Negri. And I say friends and companions advisedly, and not just interlocutors, because these pages are marked by deep bonds of amitié, of admiration, of respect, and of solidarity. And in these pages, Etienne Balibar accompanies those thinkers, converses with them, keeps them alive, living, thinking, contesting, and interpolating each and every one of us, which is something that I cherish and think we all should cherish. Now, having had the privilege of having Etienne Balibar here among us at Columbia University over the past six years, I have no doubt that each and every one of us gathered here today shares that sense of friendship, loyalty, and fidelity to Etienne. It's, uh, it's contagious uh, and it's rare uh, in the academy, but we've been blessed by it uh, with Etienne's presence. And so I'd like to put my short comments this afternoon under the sign of Unendliche as well. And I would give it the title, 
amitié infinie. Now, of the many companions that Etienne thinks with throughout the pages of these first two volumes, it is Foucault and Marx, I would argue, although I, I acknowledge I'm partial, but it's Foucault and Marx who cast the greatest shadow over the project that emerges. And if I had to capture that project in just a few words, it would be that with Balibar, we have to today think the history of the past with Foucault, but aspire to a future with Marx. And I should say that I'm using Marx here as a, as a bit of a placeholder, although he plays, of course, such an important role in Etienne's thought, but as a bit of a placeholder to represent more than simply Marx's writings, but the idea of socialism. Now, I have an intuition that uh, sometimes Etienne himself projects this formula onto uh, his own teacher, Althusser, uh, and uh, I know that I am projecting it, of course, onto uh, Etienne, but I've come to realize through this long and circuitous path and our years of thinking together that it's, it's what I too believe deep down. Um, and in the same way, I think I too am projecting, but I think I see in these volumes the formula, a formula that captures uh, Balibar's overarching thesis uh, in this relationship between uh, the past and the future. Now there's a, there's a passage in the second volume, Passion du Concept, that confirmed this intuition for me. And Balibar writes this, it's in the second volume in the blue uh, volume at page 24, uh, where, and I'm stringing together things without ellipses, but where he essentially writes, and I'll translate, the irreducible gap that always separates Foucault from Marx and Marx from Foucault is the inescapable choice in the field of theory and knowledge. In other words, whether we are discussing power and domination, discipline or economic laws, normativity or alienation, one must always go towards Marx or go towards Foucault, but one can never do both at the same time. And yet this choice structures something like a common space, even if it is a space of disaccord. Now, right there, but about at that point doesn't go further to unpack that common space in this passage, but, but I was convinced by the end of reading those two remarkable volumes that the point of adversity, to borrow a term that Balibar uh, borrows from Foucault as the title of an essay in the second volume, that the point of adversity is a temporal one. It concerns the history of the present with Foucault and the possibility of a future with Marx. Now, in that essay, A Point of Adversity, Balibar actually locates the disjuncture elsewhere. Uh, so he identifies elsewhere uh, the disjuncture between Marx and Foucault, namely in their incompatible anthropological views of the individual. And so uh, for Balibar, what distinguishes Foucault and Marx most importantly is the discordancy of their divergent views regarding the problem of individuation, uh, how subjects become individuals, uh, what their relations are, uh, how they relate to the collectivity. And it's different anthropological views uh, that uh, it identifies on the one hand uh, in Marx's emphasis on the construction of the individual in relation to exchange, property, and the commodity form. On the other hand, in Foucault's fo focus on subject creation in relation to penality, illegality, and discipline. And on the basis of this fundamental anthropological disjuncture, um, Etienne diagnoses a radical divergence in the orientation of their work. And it's that divergence that then separates him uh, ultimately from Foucault. That anthropological disjuncture pushes Foucault, uh, according to uh, Balibar, towards a type of abstract liberalism. Uh, and not, and here, don't, don't think of the neoliberalism of which Foucault has often been accused by Zamora and Michael Berendt and others. Don't, also don't think about actually existing liberalism of the institutions that surround us, but instead an abstract liberalism uh, understood as, as the desire to maximize the spaces of liberty uh, or to not be governed like this in the famous formulation uh, of Foucault's in, uh, in what is critique. So Foucault's anthropology leads him ultimately, um, in Balibar's words, this is uh, on page 187 of volume two, 
toward la reconnaissance assumée de son propre libéralisme. Right? And, and he writes, not in the sense of a doctrine of an ideology, but in the sense of a logic of action that maximizes the spaces of liberty. Okay? And in the end, on Balibar's reading, Foucault gravitates towards a future characterized by a form of liberalism that is ultimately the, the polar opposite of the communal vision uh, of socialism or the idea uh, of communism. That liberal future is, of course, anathema uh, to Etienne Balibar, and rightly so. And what separates him then is, is that orientation towards the future. I think um, Balibar makes this plain in the first book. Um, this is the, the red one, and I'm, I'm not, it's not the little red book, but we'll call it the big red book, um, uh, uh, which, uh, as uh, Bashir noted, is, and as I had suggested, it's, it's a, an, an unending history. Um, now, the, the unending or the infinite aspect of uh, history is precisely the possibility of a future, of an avenir, and not just any future, but the possibility of a revolutionary one. Um, and this is what the first volume really arcs towards. Uh, if one could think of Martin Luther King's famous statement that the arc of history bends towards justice, I would say that for Baliba, the arc of the unending history arcs towards insurrections. Uh, so uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of this volume, uh, Balibar appends a brilliant text that has not been published before, titled "Regulations, Insurrections, Utopias Towards a Socialism for the 21st Century." And um, the essay completes Balibar's history uh, by opening up to a socialist future. Uh, the essay is subdivided and numbered self-consciously. At Wit as Wittgenstein did in his Tractatus. Um, and so it is, it is itself a, a logico-philosophical uh, Tractatus on socialism. It begins with uh, what I agree to be the, the good news that socialism is back on the agenda, especially in the United States with the rise of the Democratic Socialists of America, perhaps the two presidential campaigns of Bernie Sanders, but, but it warns against a too easy embrace and so it offers, in Buddy Bao's words, a critical genealogy of the very idea of socialism. Um, and in a point-by-point -point unfolding, Buddy Bao traces the genealogy of the idea of socialism, sets aside uh, actually existing experiments of the 20th century, locates the core of socialist politics in the history of class struggle, and sets forth a program, economic, social, and institutional, for a socialist future. This program, which is aimed at the transformation of labor and production, envisages a broad system of regulations, hence the title, uh, pervasive forms of insurrection, again in the title, and concrete utopias in the title. The climax of Balibar's development is that the only possible future alternatives to the looming catastrophe of climate change, in his words, all depend in a fundamental way on the orientation of world politics towards one form or another of socialism in the years to come. Now, um, that is the unending nature of history. It is the indestructibility of revolution. No matter what, no matter the predicted ends of history, uh, there will never be an end to the coming revolutions and the possibility of a socialist horizon. And here too, there is a fidelity of thought and persistent rhythm of thinking and rethinking with his friends and interlocutors in the same way in which uh, Martin Luther King encouraged us to be drum majors for justice, which is one of his most remarkable sermons. But he about inspires us to keep faith in the possibility of a revolutionary future, to be insurrectionary drum majors. And so in that, in that essay, in that, in that 11th essay, uh, in, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's an accident, but it is the 11th essay um, uh, of the first volume, which is called Forest Socialism for the 21st Century. Uh, Balibar concludes in these inspirational words, which as I had said at the beginning, I would come back to. 
we could say a revolution or succession of revolutions must be envisaged and encouraged as of right now in order that social transformation be possible, i.e. a political process without an end in sight and without premature expropriation. The future then belongs to Marx. And again, of course, one must take Marx as a placeholder, not for everything he wrote or thought, but for a utopia. Uh, and, and, and we might, without clinging to old words, refer to it as, as a socialist utopia. Um, by contrast, the present, I believe, I sense for Buddy Barr, belongs more to Foucault in terms of the epistemological understanding of our present and the genealogical understanding of our present. And this, I think, comes clearly through the second volume, of course, which is on epistemologie, théologie, and politique. Um, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it place, Buddy Bach places this volume under the sign of uh, uh, concepts. Uh, it's called Passions, uh, Passion du Concept, the Passions for the Concept, Essays on Epistemology, Theology, and Politics. Uh, here too, I think he is uh, giving some homage to the wonderful work that's been done in the Public Concepts Project, uh, especially uh, recently organized, uh, we had recently organized a, um, a, a session thinking with Balibar, actually, uh, of the Public Concepts Project with uh, Ann Stoller, Stathis Kurguris, and Jacques Lesra, and many others, which resulted in a, a collective volume of which one of the essays uh, comes from in, uh, in Écrit Deux. Now this second volume, and again here too I may be biased, but I do intuit this to be the case, bears the stronger imprimatur of Foucault. It is Foucault's notion of a history of truth, attributable earlier to Pascal as Balibar emphasizes, but so wholly reimagined and coined by Foucault. Uh, it is Foucault's notion of a point de récit, um, uh, to which Balibar returns and is most in dialogue. And it is Foucault on the conceptual level then, on the epistemological terrain, uh, on the way to think the present, that seems to guide a lot of this uh, conversation. So ultimately, um, I would propose thinking the history of the present with Foucault, aspiring to a future with Marx. This may be the synthèse disjunctive disjunctive synthesis that uh, Etienne Balibar and Gilles Deleuze uh, hoped and hoped to realize. Um, I, I confess that this has had a real lasting impact on my own thought, um, uh, mostly my most recent work. And um, I think Etienne makes this really astute observation in his analytics of socialism that the socialist project has always included two violently opposed tendencies, one statist and the other autogestionnaire. Um, it's the statist side, of course, of socialism that has been dominant. Uh, Baribar works to recuperate the idea of socialism in his essays from that statist side. Um, I, 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 I am right now thinking and privileging more the cooperationist or the autogestion side, um, uh, but uh, it, 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 we're still in the same place, uh, and it leaves me in a similar disjunctive synthesis, uh, I believe, uh, as uh, Etienne. So in conclusion, I've always been struck uh, over these years by the generosity and humility of Etienne Badibar in all of our many interactions and seminars over the past six years. Uh, I also have always been struck by the way Etienne refers to his refers and referred in, in our conversations to his own teacher, Louis Gisert, as mon maître. Um, it had always struck me. Um, and reading through these remarkable essays, I realized that what it reflects is a deep sense of loyalty and fidelity that characterizes, uh, to me, uh, the very essence of Etienne Balibar. I think for us at Columbia, for this community of thinkers who have been blessed by your presence, Etienne, uh, I think it's fitting to say that we too uh, shall and should call you, Etienne, notre maître. For me personally, it's been the greatest privilege and a source of inspiration to think with you over these past six years uh, and uh, to collaborate 
uh, on our seminars uh, like a drum beat. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Bernard. And I'm very moved by those words because I, I'm, I'm, I'm following you in calling a chair, not uh, Mets as well, because actually the very first time I saw a chain was he was with Althusser. And afterwards, Althusser, this was before Althusser became my, my professor and my mentor uh, for many years as he had been uh, uh, Etienne's mentor as well. And so when I, I agree with you because uh, through Etienne, I, 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 I like him, love Etienne and through him also, I remember my own mentor Althusser. So he's doubly more met in this case. Okay. Uh, um, now, it is my great pleasure to uh, give the floor to my friend and colleague, Emmanuel Sada. Uh, Emmanuel is a professor of French and history. She is the director of the Center for French and Francophone uh, Studies. And uh, uh, she is currently in charge of the signature curriculum of our own Columbia University because she's the director of contemporary civilization, as you know. Contemporary Civilization was supposed to celebrate its centenary uh, 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 this year. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is, uh, um, is uh, you know, just impeding many, many different things. And I hope that we will have a, a, an opportunity soon in a different world to celebrate uh, with uh, Emmanuel um, the centenary of Contemporary Civilization. Her uh, uh, field of research and teaching is the history of the French Empire in the 19th and 20th century. And, uh, and something she shares with Bernard is that she has a specific interest in, in law. Uh, her first book, Les Enfants de la Colonie, Les Métis de l'Empire Français, entre suggestion et citoyenneté, translated into English as Empire's Children, Race, Filiation, and Citizenship in the French Colonies, uh, um, uh, in 2012, following the publication in French in 2007. Uh, uh, currently, Emmanuel is writing a historiographical book that is reflecting on French and European colonization as a history of the present. And she is also working, she's working on so many things, I don't know how she does it, on a project on law and violence in Algeria and France in the 19th century. Uh, so, uh, Emmanuel, it is my pleasure to, call, to give you the floor to comment on uh, HM's Ecrit 1 et 2. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Bashir, for this introduction. Um, thank you very much uh, for including me in this, uh, in this discussion. Uh, so, thank you to Shani. Thank you to Etienne. Very uh, forgiving Etienne. As uh, Bashir did not say, I was actually the student of Etienne. And I think that was 92, 93, was at Paris 1, that when uh, Etienne was still teaching in, uh, at, at Paris 1, La Sorbonne. And I must say that I wish I had been a more assiduous student uh, because I would be a better historian today. Uh, today we are being called to bring the attention of our community of readers and thinkers whose boundaries are now on Zoom more elastic and unscrutable than ever, uh, to Etienne Balibart's complete work, right? That's the title of our event. Uh, Etienne has already protested a little. Uh, it is a, actually a paradoxical formulation since we are dealing here with only two of the six announced volumes of articles and chapters. It is also more uh, deeply, more importantly, an oxymor oxymoronic formulation, because as we will see, Balibar's concept of work or works precludes completedness. It is like history endless. In any case, we have here two volumes of articles and book chapters that divide along uh, apparently familiar lines, right? The first volume is entitled Histoire Interminable, Endless History. The translation, as uh, Bashir noted, is difficult, right? Is this never ending history, history with no end? Uh, unachievable history. Uh, it offers, this volume offers historical, political, philosophical reflections from one century to the other, from the from 1914 to the 2010s, 
and it is organized around a double axis of events. There are chapters in 1914, 1917, 1968, and concepts, um, and three, three central concepts, uh, which uh, will, to some extent, guide my, uh, my few comments today. Traces, frontiers, and conjectures. The second volume is titled Passions, I'm sorry, Passion du Concept, right? And so that's something that I've even harder time translating into English. P passions for and of concepts. Um, it includes, th this volume includes much more recognizable philosophical essays in two senses. First, there are essays on phys philosophical works. So we have Machiavelli, Canguillem, Badiou, Foucault, and of course, through them, Kant, Hegel, Marx, Althusser, Derrida and Rancière. And part of these philosophical essays are organized, or reflection on, on, on those authors are uh, organized uh, largely, not, not uniquely, but largely under a reflection on the history of uh, the project of a history of truth. These essays are also philosophical in a second sense, insofar as they reflect on what philosophy does or can do and only very, rarely, only very rarely should do, although a normative stance, while very discreet, is not entirely absent from the volume. Actually, what philosophy does uh, with one part of the world, the world of people living together, the political world, even though Balibar uh, makes a point of telling us this is also, it's much larger than that, it's also the, you know, the world, natural world, and different kinds of words, but I, I, I would make an argument that um, I think it is important to note today in 2020 that um, um, there is a, a, a endless, interminable, indécrotable, maybe as we say in French, humanism in, ba in Baliba's work, right? Uh, what we are interested in is how we live together, the political world. And what philosophy does, just in case you were wondering, is to work out to work with and through concepts. And that's part of the challenge, only very concept that it has produced on its own. It chooses and it works with concepts that have to a large extent um, been made uh, outside of it, right? Um, and this work with concepts is, is obviously has for uh, its major objective to make the word intelligible, right? Uh, and so I would say that the last chapter, the, the, the last chapter of the second volume on the concept of concept uh, is actually, it's called réouverture, right? Is uh, in some way the key or the key for the, for the two volumes, it illuminates both volumes. But remember here, there is no Owl of Minerva, right? Uh, it's only, we have here only two volumes of six, so there is more to come. And in addition, concepts, including the concept of concept are animated. Um, while they might morph, migrate, and sometimes become irrelevant, they are also on their own endless. They are interminable, right? Um, right now, I think we can but wonder about this editorial division in two volumes, the separation, the partage between these works, right? Between the empirical, historical, political on one hand, and the conceptual, theoretical, philosophical on the other. Obviously, the very idea of the passion of concepts uh, implies that they are always already in history. Concepts are shaped by, traversed, modified by historical events as much as they shape them. And to make it simple, and certainly too simple, uh, one could say that these two volumes are response to Nietzsche's famous stance in essay 2, chapter 13 of the Genealogy of Morals, right? Yeah, they quote, all concepts in which an entire process is semiotically concentrated elude definition. Only that which has no history can be defined. At an earlier stage, on the contrary, the synthesis of meanings can still be disentangled as well as change. And obviously, this is, you know, this is a foundational statement for uh, the very enterprise of a genealogy. Strictly speaking, then, we cannot form adequate concepts of historical objects. And the main task of the philosopher, for someone like Nietzsche, is to do philological, and it is related, genealogical work, 
it is, to a great extent, retrospective. While Balibar doesn't recall from philosophical, philological exercises in these volumes, I think he proposes a concept of concept, which does not include necessarily stable definition. Thus, it's, it escapes the Nietzschean uh, framework to a large extent. Like Foucault's, Balibar's genealogies are prospective, or more specifically in Nietzschean's um, lexicon, conjectural. They constantly ask not what are we become, but what are we becoming today? So as you see, I think the division between the two volumes is to a large degree artificial, conventional, maybe the result of the decision of an editor, maybe Etienne will tell us. Um, there is no neat border between history and philosophy, between volume one and two. To make an analogy to a piece which uh, I will try to come back later, like France and Algeria, volume one and two are more than one, but less than two. That being said, what, what concepts? To think about what problems? Who decides which questions and issues require, require our attention, our work to produce intelligibility? Etienne reports a very pugnant uh, anecdote in the central chapter of volume two, that's chapter seven, called in French, La Philosophie et l'Actualité, in which um, his fellow philosophy uh, student, Robert Linart, asked him, as Etienne, in 1967, to justify his position in favor of the relative autonomy of theoretical work, right? Of, Emmanuel, of Emmanuel. Yes. Not a student, a friend, same age as me. I know, it was your fellow student. Your fellow okay, student. okay, sorry, sorry, excuse me. I was me. actually hesitating because that's 67, and so you're already, you, you, you were already, you're already being a teacher, right, in Algeria? You, you just came back from Algeria, and you, were, you had been a, already a professor or teacher, but in any case, you were still studying. Uh, so you're, you're still very young, but that, what is important, I suppose, is that it's, it's uh, you know, you obviously went to the same school, you've been uh, friends, and it's just before 68, right? And at that time, just before 68, uh, before, you know, um, before becoming a, a Mao, or maybe he was already a Mao, I don't know, uh, he was already a Mao, but because the question he asked you was to uh, justify your position in favor of the, you know, of the autonomy, right, of philosophy, the relative autonomy of, of philosophy, as opposed to the Maoist imperative for intellectuals to put themselves as a service of the people, right? And it's obviously a very poignant uh, anecdote when we know that Linhart um, confined himself to silence, right, to more or less absolute silence uh, after 1981. In any case, at the time, uh, Linhart asked you, asked him, uh, Etienne, uh, if not the people, who commissions the philosopher? How and by whom are theoretical problems constituted? This is by page 192 of the, um, of the French edition. And you tell us that uh, in 2003, but I think it would still be the case in, tw in 2020, uh, that your inability to answer the question in 1967 kept you going and uh, in a way served as an unrelenting command to think about the relationship between theory and politics. So this chapter on la philosophie and l'actualité, uh, chapter seven, is a partial answer, a necessarily partial answer to this question of who asks the philosopher to think how and uh, how are the problems of the philosopher constituted by whom, right? And um, your, the answer you give in that chapter is uh, very much linked to, the, uh, to a reflection on the actuality of concept, l'actualité, and that's maybe the most difficult concept, uh, the notion of, the, of actuality to translate into English, but here it's both in the sense of the timeliness of, uh, of, of, of conceptual work, but also the multiple relationship that concepts have uh, to the world, right? And so those two, I see those two meanings are very much uh, connected in your attempt at answering what, who has the question that the philosopher uh, puts himself in a situation of answering and how they are uh, articulated and formulated. 
Uh, so you do that in that chapter, but I think uh, a less theoretical and maybe more anthropological observer, and I'm using anthropology here in the sense that you use it to denote the social sciences in general, so let's say me, right, uh, would note a series of external and internal demands put on, uh, put on the philosopher, in this case, Etienne Balibar, when he is commissioned, right, commanded to think about a problem. Uh, that is to say, when Etienne, for example, is being asked to write the chapters that are included in those collected works, right? So all these chapters came, all this reflection came at a certain occasion, and most of the time, an invitation, maybe even a, um, maybe even a uh, interpolation, right? So among the external demands, there are those of pure contingency, that is to say, the advent of events, which cannot be entirely placed in a linear series of causes and effects, and, that we, and thus require quick conceptual adjustments. The multiple and related crises through which we are living now, and about which we're going to speak uh, next week, are an illustrative case of the kind of apparent, but I think I would say real contingency that the philosopher has to deal with, and that's heterogeneous, right? That comes from the outside. Uh, another element of these commissions put on the philosopher, asked from the philosopher, is that um, what we could call, I think, the politics of pro propinquity, uh, to borrow the beautiful title of a volume to which uh, Etienne contributed, one essay that is reproduced in volume one, the politics of propinquity. I'm sure I pronounce this wrongly, but uh, it's nonetheless a very beautiful word. And by this, I mean that the, 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 uh, the problem that uh, the philosopher here, Etienne, is uh, thinking about are often brought up by friends, or at least by people who have been friends or were friends at some point in his life. Even though obviously those problems are immediately deconstructed, if you want, reformulated, reshaped, uh, rearticulated, right? But still, they often correspond to a demand and a demand from friends. So in the volume that we see here, uh, we see these uh, networks of, you know, uh, of commissions and interpolations. We see Badiou, obviously, we see Derrida, we see Rancière, we see uh, Dao Djabal, right? And we see many others in other books, but I think those characters are the, maybe the most central in, the, in those first two, vol two volumes. Uh, philosophical work requires a community and maybe even something more, maybe something like a commensality, right? Friendship in a very large Aristotelian sense might be its condition. And one tension constantly animating the work of Etienne, the philosophical work, is the desire to verify, I quote, uh, verifier si nous pouvons produire de l'intelligibilité ensemble. We never do this alone, right? We verify if we can bring to some degree of intelligibility together. And I could not find the page where I wrote this down, and that made me immediately think of Etienne and the quotation from books, which doesn't remember the page where it comes from. Uh, so, uh, but I found this a very uh, fascinating way of thinking, right? Verifier si nous pouvons produire de l'intelligibilité ensemble. So I think one very important question, one maybe uncomfortable question for Etienne today, but uh, he knows me, we're friends, so I can ask him uncomfortable questions. Uh, and it's a question that I think has been posed to Etienne in the past years by many young thinkers, mostly from outside the field of philosophy. It's a question about what happens when friendship is not assumed or even guaranteed, when the vérifié ensemble does not make sense because the ensemble is not established. If you, Etienne, insist that the most important political concepts are necessarily contested, that is to say built on conflicting notions, uh, which is really a central way of your concept of concepts, why are you writing when interpelled by your friends, right? Not what by people who are more in situation of conflicts, deep conflicts. Basic conflicts with you. That's one. That's one question. Uh, so those were for the heterogeneous demands. There are also interior demands, intrinsic demands. I think, as Etienne would say, uh, on, that are put on the work of philosopher. When he gives himself the task of uh, thinking 
of producing uh, mutability. And these inter demands, I would say, are the traces, which are not just the presence of a past, but also the coherence of a personal and intellectual trajectory and a direction for the future. One example among other of those traces, which I won't develop, is uh, the conceptual work on the frontier, which I think cannot be divorced from the reflection on the experience of passing borders uh, from Chichen in Algeria between 65 and 67 to becoming a, uh, a multiplied intellectual without borders, uh, now over Zoom, everywhere, uh, that is to say confined just to the borders of our screens. Another formulation of this interior demand is, um, and, and I'm sure this vocabulary is not very adequate, but uh, it would take, take me more time to, and more rumination to think about a better one. But um, another formulation would be the ethical injunction not to give up on the necessity of understanding. And so let me quote Etienne himself. It's a long quotation that I think for me, it's one of, for reading that book was one of the central uh, quotations that, that, that uh, arrested my attention. It's on page uh, 245 of volume two, so it's in the réouverture, on the concluding uh, and reopening chapter of the concept de concept, un se divise en deux. And actually, I'm quoting not my own translation, thank God, I'm quoting from a uh, English translation of that passage because uh, it's been, or will be, uh, unclear if it's already out, uh, published in one of the uh, political concepts volume, uh, one of the volume uh, uh, published by Brown, Brown University Press, I think, uh, uh, in the context of the uh, 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 very important work done by this group um, on um, mostly New York, not only New York, but mostly New York group on, um, on political concepts, right? So on um, political lexical, uh, I forgot what the name of this, but all this is online, you can find this. Uh, and Etienne says, for my part, I remain very stubbornly attached to the idea that inside and outside official philosophy, concept and conceptualization are names for an intellectual activity in the sense of an activity that produces intelligibility or make things intelligible, to create an intelligible order, ordinary ad intellectum, as Spinoza defined his third kind of knowledge, while immediately associating with uh, an ethical injunction, said intelligere, with an exclamation point, and this is why I was mentioning something like a normative uh, uh, stands here, right? I think, I think uh, Etienne very much follows Spinoza here. Uh, there is an injunction and it's an ethical injunction. In other terms, we need concepts because we think intelligibility, whether it is about nature, passions, or politics. I believe that the reference to concepts conce contains something like an injunction not to give up on the necessity of understanding in the very middle of our affections and actions." End of quote. And yet, this quest for intelligibility has to find another concept of concepts than the one offered by the philosophical tradition. To go back to Plato, which is what Etienne does himself in this last chapter, concepts have, to be, um, have been most of the times defined by proportion. That is to say something like harmony, right? In a republic, uh, Plato tells us that the concept of justice should be formulated like we formulate the concept of 12, right? Like, it's a proportion, it's six times two, or four times three, or three times four, right? A certain proportion. It also requires separation from conflicting, muddy, toxic opinions about justice. The concept works as a concept only if it's separated from the domain of imitations and of opinion, that is to say, from the domain of never-ending conflicts. That's a, I mean, that's one traditional, um, take on concepts in Western philosophy. Uh, the concept of the concept that uh, Etienne offers us breaks with these two constraints. It is both inseparable from empirical reality, no line between different levels of reality, and defined by conflicts. 
concept and those two things are related to each other. Concepts are, uh, Belibar tells us, after others, uh, essentially contested. They are by nature the place of conflict between different views of a certain reality. And you could ask him if those views are, can, can those views be reduced to uh, Plato's um, notion of opinion? But it's not a history of philosophy, so you, you, you won't ask him. Um, and it is not in spite, uh, but because of this contested nature that concepts brings about, bring about intelligibility, bringing together elements that we thought were separated. Um, and here I think there is a very important, and maybe uh, for my taste or for my ability to understand what uh, Etienne was trying to do, there is a very important contrast between contestation and conflict, uh, in, in, which are again an essential, necessary uh, quality, property of concepts on one hand, and dialectic on the other. Uh, maybe Etienne plans to tell us more today or another day about this. But in any case, I would like to conclude briefly by pointing to the uh, surplus value of intelligibility of this kind of reflection, this concept of concepts for those who, like me, are outside of philosophy and yet think through concepts. That's what historians are, in general, social scientists do, right? We think through concepts, and it's through concepts that we don't think very much about. Um, among the many essentially contested concepts put to work in those two volumes, and in other, in other works by Etienne, uh, such as democracy, socialism, violence, civility, markets, or border, I would especially insist on the concept of border, which is both a historical empirical notion and a set of institutions, which are obviously related conflicts, and, and a concept which is uh, which allows us to uh, see things because of its conflicted multiplicity, starting with the constant friction between the notion of border and frontier, which exists in French, even though in French we don't to use uh, only one word, la frontière. Uh, an article that is particularly interesting to the historian of colonization, Algeria and France, one or two nations. Uh, is the, actually the oldest one in this uh, collection of, um, of, of, uh, of edited works. Uh, it was written in 1995, that is to say 25 years ago. Uh, what the contested concept of frontier helps us understand that the separation between the two nations after decolonization was not achievable. It was interminable. It was open-ended, it was without an end. Uh, from this perspective, tons of empirical phenomena, such as linguistic practices, for example, but other, many others, religious practices, become visible, that is to say, intelligible to the social scientist, right? So uh, it's by looking at the multiplicity that is at work in the concept itself that you can see multiple uh, and, and sometimes contradictory phenomena that actually become much more, much clearer once you have this uh, notion of contestation in mind. It also opens, and I think that's um, as important, maybe more important for Etienne, it opens a space for political action. A contested concept means that we can contest it and we can contest the reality that it produces. The border slash frontier between France and Algeria or between Europe and Africa is today more permeable and more rigid than it was 25 years ago. With many more dead every year in the Mediterranean, the question of intelligibility is even more pressing than it was then. And I think uh, we can thank Etienne for never giving up on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. So now I will be, before I give the floor to you, Etienne, uh, let me just mention that this uh, uh, open and an ending What's conversation happening? will. Uh, what's what's happening? What's what's happening? Again, resume the next week 
on September 24. I'm saying that for the people who ha will have to. Hello? Oh. Okay, so I hear you, so it's, uh, it's not a problem. While you are answering, you are in fact, and, uh, and Emmanuel, please, if you can take into account two questions that were, that came through the Q&A. Uh, yes. Because they are both about individual individuation. Uh, yes. Bloggers would like you to uh, see uh, if you would say if you consider that uh, 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 Foucault also was a theorist of trans individuality. Uh -huh. question coming, another question coming from Elif Sander, uh, who uh, invites you to uh, um, open up the concept of individuation because you have you, yourself written elsewhere about Gilles Simon's concept of individuality. Ashia, I, I can't hear anything. There's a big trouble. Richard, can you hear me? This is Shani. No, not now. There's a big you trouble. Can, uh, the, some connection uh, as you and uh, right has become unstable. How is individuation? Okay, uh, Chen, you can see this, the last question that, that Bashir mentioned in the Q&A box, if you couldn't hear what he said. Bashir, we're having trouble with your connection. Oh, you're not hearing me. We can hear you, but it was a little, um, it got a little unstable. Okay, so, so please, Etienne, uh, go ahead in your response. So the, 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 the question is written in the, in the Q&A. Okay. Basically, how does uh, uh, concept of individuation affect the possibility of revolutionary politics? How do you see that? Okay, good. Let me close that. How do I do that? Like this, probably, yes. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, in a sense, I find myself in the worst possible situation I uh, could uh, uh, think of in my uh, nightmares. I mean, having to, not to justify, of course, but to, to uh, take responsibility for <laughs> what I have written. This is inevitable. Um, it's a course uh, situation anybody who writes uh, essays or books must be ready to face but uh, believe me it's not uh, completely uh, uh, easy on the other hand I mean I've been welcomed by you all uh, in this place this virtual place to which I also uh, belong in a manner that is uh, at the same time so uh, friendly so generous and uh, intellectually so um, propinquous, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, uh, <laughs> which uh, uh, shows, uh, uh, of course, that there are many questions to be resolved among us, but there is also a kind of deep understanding of what is most important uh, in, 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 in our profession and in today's uh, work. Okay, so I won't be too long on that. And I have to say as well that, uh, um, okay, the, the, the session is uh, uh, programmed for now another half an hour. Is, is that uh, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, so I shouldn't be too long. Uh, I shouldn't, <laughs> which uh, is uh, again something like a kind of uh, contradiction. There are so many, so many problems, and uh, at the same time, uh, one has to go to the, the center. And I am addressing people <laughs> who I'm sure are also friends in the most general sense of the term. There could be opponents, of course, or people who want to challenge what I have to say. Uh, but for me, they're all, of course, uh, uh, friends uh, uh, tonight. And I don't see you. I mean, I don't see them, which is uh, our fate in this strange uh, situation. Okay. So I believe that uh, uh, the first thing I should do, perhaps, and uh, You've been commenting on Histoire Interminable, uh, open-ended, etc. And also Emmanuel uh, said that passion du concept is, uh, is not easily uh, 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 translated. So perhaps I should say just a few quick words 
uh, on uh, uh, what this project is about, uh, why it is not over complete, <laughs> in which sense, nevertheless, it tries to uh, synthesize uh, some of my work in the past uh, uh, years, and uh, and uh, and 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 the, the meaning of that. So, so I reacted to the idea that these were over complete because uh, uh, over complete or collected works. Uh, uh, um, uh, in French, certainly in English, also I'm sure, uh, uh, immediately indicates. Can you hear me? Is that uh, yes? Immediately uh, indicates or uh, orientates our attention in two uh, 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 directions that I find, of course, uh, absolutely <laughs> uh, unacceptable. Uh, the the one would be uh, uh, that uh, uh, I uh, believe to be a writer or a, a philosopher uh, whose uh, works display such an internal co coherence and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and and systematicity that at some point uh, 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 they have to be uh, uh, collected together. Um, and the other one, of course, but that is almost the same uh, idea, idea uh, is that uh, usually when collected works, papers, and so on, over complete are published, this is because you're dead. I mean, this is because you're dead. Huh? Uh, so that would mean that I'm dead. Huh? And uh, uh, believe me, in a sense, this idea was haunting me at some point. The idea of collecting different uh, essays and articles on various subjects, trying to show how uh, um, uh, they uh, uh, repeatedly, ceaselessly return to, to the same questions, trying to bring in intelligibility as Emmanuel uh, Sada did not uh, come from me. It came from friends, from the uh, publisher, of course, La Découverte, and from some younger colleagues who haven't been my students in the proper sense, but uh, etc. And so, uh, um, uh, they, 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 they suggested that. And it occurred to me that uh, perhaps I could try and cheat a little bit or, uh, again, that was a commission <laughs> in a sense, uh, in the sense in which you referred it to. But this kind of, uh, this time, of course, a slightly different commission, not to address this or that burning issue of the present. Uh, uh, incidentally, I mean, I'm so, of course, uh, uh, pleased and moved, uh, uh, Emmanuel, that you isolate this paper on uh, France and, uh, and, and, and Nigeria, which has provoked, interestingly, both uh, uh, very positive reactions from some well-known uh, historians uh, and some very negative reactions, which I completely understand, justified from, uh, I'd say, post-colonial uh, 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 scholars uh, working very seriously today on the relationship between France, Northern Africa, the the Islamic world in general, and etc. 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 And I'm 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 pleased that you refer to that because the circumstances in which that paper was written were absolutely tragic. I mean, they were. They, this was the moment of the uh, uh, Algerian civil war, uh, in which uh, uh, many of my uh, friends, our friends, were caught, uh, uh, some killed. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, everybody uh, 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 remembers Asia Djeba's uh, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, book, Le Blanc de l'Algérie, The White of Algeria. Yeah. Asia was just my generation, I mean, a few years uh, older, but of course she was on the other side during the, the war, so to, so, so, so to speak. So that was really a kind of uh, interpolation which I seized to try and say something that would be more uh, conceptual, uh, uh, if you like. Whereas the idea of collecting my uh, 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 papers looked like something more, I would say, academic and, uh, and uh, uh, relaxed. And I said to myself something like, uh, but perhaps you're not yet dead. I mean, perhaps you're not yet dead. Huh? On the other hand, there's a problem. Huh? What to do now? Uh, what to do? Continue the same thing? Write the books I could never write? Uh, <laughs> because I have to admit I'm not good at that. Uh, 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 writing systematic books, 300 pages, uh, 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 and so on, that's too late. Huh? Uh, uh, and then it, it occurred to me that I could try and seize the occasion to, yes, isolate uh, 
some of the uh, um, main topics, put together what I think is the most significant or the less uh, stupid in, in what I have written, and then ask myself, does that include uh, or contain something like an idea or problematic uh, uh, idea. Uh, and of course, the result is uh, something that uh, you said uh, is artificial. Uh, it's artificial. Uh, uh, it was on purpose that I, uh, you, you were not uh, nasty, but you were, uh, 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 in a sense, it was on purpose because I said to myself, the coming volumes uh, have to identify or isolate certain key issues. So I will change slightly the order that has been announced. Uh, the next volume, I hope to be able to complete it uh, <laughs> this year, of course, uh, uh, will be on, in fact, uh, the, the cosmopolitan, idea of the cosmopolitan question, uh, uh, including, of course, considerations on uh, uh, war and peace, consideration on translation, uh, uh, and so on. And, uh, and, the, and the idea of border, the question of border, of course, we will, will return very centrally there. And the, 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 the next one, uh, which is, uh, in a sense, the most problematic, is on race and racism, because I wrote uh, uh, a lot on these issues already a long time ago, but much more has been written uh, since. And above all, the situation in which we are is no uh, uh, longer exactly the same. So there in particular, I have a kind of uh, uh, hunting uh, question in my uh, uh, mind. Uh, what I wrote uh, uh, can I uh, um, uh, can I still use it for, for, for myself or propose it to others? And what do I need to acknowledge as uh, as limits or limitations? And how can I, with the help of others and conversations and so on, can I add to not remain caught in my old uh, uh, ideas? And then there would be something on communism and socialism and something on the critique of political economy, because I have re to return to my old uh, uh, friend Marx. I mean, and 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 and, and Foucault, of course, uh, maybe as uh, as uh, as well. Uh, so let me add. Uh, I hope I'm not boring you or bother, bothering you. But uh, 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 one quick remark, because I could not be very uh, sensible to that when you repeatedly used the category master and uh, Bernard said wonderful things about uh, my master and my becoming a master and so on and so on. You know, I mean, uh, I, we, uh, many of us, I mean, professional philosophers, but not only, are great readers of Hegel. Uh, and so we know that the only absolute master in Hegel's words is death, uh, precisely. Uh, so, and I derive from there the idea that uh, all other masters are relative masters, if you, if you can say uh, that. Huh? So sometimes they try to behave like absolute masters. Uh, what's an absolute master? Is a, the master to whom you cannot reply. I mean, the, 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 the relationship is so profoundly dissymmetric that there's absolutely no possibility of uh, uh, reciprocity. So I'm not uh, entertaining the uh, uh, naive and sentimental uh, uh, idea that whenever we teach or we write, we are uh, absolutely uh, 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 inter in, 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 in interchangeable. But I do very much believe that uh, uh, the situation, uh, 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 the dissymmetric situation becomes reversed at some uh, point. Uh, and if I may say so, the three of you on this uh, uh, screen have really become my masters now. And, uh, and if I can, uh, 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 friends masters, uh, and, and if I can uh, reach uh, perhaps not the end, but some point in the uh, development of this uh, uh, project, this will be only because I uh, uh, try not to remain enclosed in my own uh, uh, writings. Uh, that, that would be a, a complete nightmare. But now, um, uh, let me try and say uh, 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 one thing to uh, uh, each of you, only one. And I take the questions in the, in the, in the, in the, in the order. Uh, I will not react to everything you said. That's uh, that's not uh, possible. And I'll try to uh, also include uh, uh, something from uh, uh, the audience. Uh, now, um, uh, to uh, Bashir, you said, uh, my question is, uh, what can you say about the idea of alter-globalizing Europe? Uh, so, um, 
I don't know uh, if this translation is, is good. In, uh, in French, we have a difference between globalization and mondialization. Globalization comes from the English, it's a pure and simple uh, transposition, but it's been now mainly used in a relatively negative manner by people who are critical of the kind of globalization that contemporary capitalism uh, 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 produces and the kind of uh, new imperialism, to put it like uh, David Harvey, that it uh, uh, harbors. Whereas mondialization is more French and therefore seems to be <laughs> nicer, but basically it refers to the same phenomenon. So at some point, as some of you, I mean all of you might remember, uh, at the times of the uh, uh, World Social Forum, uh, to which many of my great friends and perhaps uh, above all uh, 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 Emmanuel Wallerstein, with whom hasn't been mentioned yet, but who, uh, as uh, any reader will see, uh, has a huge place in volume uh, uh, one, because after Althusser, is probably the one with whom I worked most uh, uh, directly and and closely. So of course, wasn't he? I wasn't his student, but etc. So these people, of course, were active in the uh, in what succeeded third worldism. Uh, that is uh, 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 um, uh, alter the idea of an alternative uh, 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 form of globalization that would challenge precisely the dominant uh, 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 neo-imperialist uh, forms. Whether that has succeeded or not, not completely, we, we all know, uh, is, a, is, a, is an interesting question. But uh, uh, inevitably the question would arise at what kind of uh, uh, function or what a role a European construction, uh, probably a European construction of a different type uh, would play in that new uh, 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 confrontation. And since uh, 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 these discussions also took place at moments of great crisis and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and dramatic moments, uh, particularly after 9-11, uh, etc., um, I was once again uh, 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 trying to justify the idea that Europe as a construction, as a virtual construction, uh, uh, we see today uh, that this construction is almost collapsing, but at the time, uh, uh, um, uh, perhaps it will survive, uh, 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 should not remain passive, uh, should not remain passive. And my conviction was that Europe, the role that Europe or European countries, European citizens and so on, could play in that, uh, in that uh, uh, situation would, was not to try, uh, according to a narrative that you hear very frequently, but maybe next week we'll talk uh, about that uh, uh, again, to try to be the third uh, um, uh, player in the new uh, so-called multilateral uh, contest for the hegemony in, 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 in the world. The declining empire of America on one side, the rising empire of China on the other side, and perhaps next week we'll discuss the extent to which uh, uh, this uh, uh, has now uh, really uh, reversed the uh, relationship of forces. And then Europe, and the third biggest economy, uh, perhaps even the, the, the first in absolute terms. So I, uh, uh, of course, tried something to, uh, uh, which was complicated, uh, well, not pure and simply to explain that uh, Europe should adopt, uh, which is in a sense the, uh, the, 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 um, the complacent uh, narrative of some people in, 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 in the left, on the left in, in Europe. Let's become uh, 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 Latin American uh, 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 peasants, let's become African uh, 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 intellectuals or uh, uh, um, uh, uh, citizens and so on. Let's put us, uh, uh, let's, let's fancy that we are on the other side of the great North-South divide. Huh? But not on the other side, but the only possibility for us to uh, uh, emerge again as actors and citizens in today's history, of course, is to completely settle the accounts of colonization and create or invent uh, a Europe 
that uh, 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 is, is, is really, in proper terms, a, a post-colonial, in the positive sense, uh, 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 Europe. And therefore, forges or is able to forge an alliance with uh, 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 all the other parts of the, uh, the world. Needless to say, we're very far from that uh, uh, today. I'm, I'm extremely pessimistic in this respect. But in the last essay that uh, Bernard Arcos so generously uh, uh, commented, the one on the possible socialism of the 21st uh, century, of course I insist on utopias, and in some sense Europe is perhaps a utopia or is one of the, uh, I insist on insurrections, thank you so much uh, uh, Bernard for uh, uh, saying that I'm more than ever uh, uh, committed to the idea that we need insurrectional uh, uh, moves uh, and there are insurrectional moves of many different sizes. Uh, Black Lives Matter is an insurrectional move of the, the most ob obvious form but there are uh, uh, others. Some are local, some are more uh, 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 trans, uh, transborder. But I also introduced a notion which in my own eyes is problematic and again we might talk about that next time but is not uh, eliminable I mean which is the notion of global regulations uh, uh, I don't see how we could face the question of global uh, warming how we could face the notions of uh, huge uh, 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 inequalities the different distribution of labor uh, 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 on earth a, a capacity that's almost a dream but capacity to address the uh, continuous rise of armed violence and, uh, and, and armaments in, in the world and so on, if there is not something like, uh, there are not something like global regulations. But who are the actors of the global regulations? Inevitably, uh, you said I'm more on the side of uh, uh, assembly than on the side of, uh, of state socialism. Also not on the side of state socialism, but I believe that we need institutional uh, powers to uh, uh, address these questions of uh, uh, regulations. And I hoped, and I still retain some kind of uh, uh, hope, that a Europe that is no longer Eurocentric, <laughs> to put it uh, uh, like that, another oxymoron, could be a player in that, uh, uh, in that uh, an important player in that game. So I don't know what Bashir would say, maybe he would say ridiculous, but <laughs> that's my... Uh, okay, so I have to, 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 to simplify enormously, uh, I know, but uh, so to Bernard, I would say I accept, I accept your dichotomy uh, and your temporal representation of the uh, dichotomy Foucault and Marx. Uh, I have a tendency, I have a tendency, I admit that, I have a tendency to uh, push, uh, perhaps this is a trick, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, that, uh, to push such uh, 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 confrontations or combinations to what, borrowing Foucault, I call the point of adversity. I always found and I keep thinking that it is more interesting, more productive, more useful to view intellectual resources that we simultaneously uh, uh, need as conflictual, perhaps even in some sense incompatible, uh, incompatible than just complementary and forming some sort of nice uh, 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 harmony. And there are so many among our friends, I mean, Negri is the most beautiful example in a sense, but there are many others for whom, and I don't want to caricature uh, him, uh, 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 Marx and, and Foucault nicely uh, 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 adapt to one another, that I wanted to provoke a little bit more uh, uh, reflection. But the thing I, uh, uh, the two things I'd, I'd add on that is thank you, uh, uh, the person who, uh, the two uh, uh, um, uh, auditors who asked the questions about uh, uh, individuations and trans in, 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 in individuality. Trans individuality is a notion that comes from different authors and which uh, always try to overcome uh, somehow it's an alternative to intersubjectivity. It tries to overcome the old dilemma of uh, community on one side and like it or not, communism was and remains on that side and individualism uh, 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 on the 
on the other side, with which the Western, so-called Western idea of liberty is very directly uh, 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 as, as associated. So you didn't uh, quote, you, you, you put it in your written version, the extraordinary formula that uh, my young colleague and friend Roberto Negro applied to Foucault. He said he's a Nietzschean uh, 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 communist. Uh, so Nietzschean communist is really like water and fire. I mean, that's, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, but what, but it touches something in Marx's, uh, 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 in Marx's legacy, which is of course the fact that uh, uh, when Marx spoke of socialism, and that's again our problem, of course, he always insisted on the tendencies from within capitalism itself to socialize and to overcome pure competition uh, among individuals. So it was the uh, uh, notion of the common that came to the fore. But in the most remarkable philosophical text, and here I'm contradicting Althusser completely, I mean, which Marx wrote uh, uh, in his first uh, uh, period, the idea of communism is not the idea of having the common once forever eliminate or, or, or subjugate or overcome uh, uh, individualism. It's the idea of having a form of community within which the individual as such is not only valorized, but in some sense liberated from the worst alienations of bourgeois indiv individualism. Uh, and I do believe that Foucault, uh, who is not a communist, I mean, uh, uh, in the in the traditional sense, and even less a socialist, I mean, uh, uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, is offering an alternative view of individuality, which has Nietzschean roots, as you know, and and, and others, fully compatible with political commitment and uh, and uh, and engagement and, and 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 action that pushes that brings this issue uh, again to the fore. But I would also add that we cannot, that's not against you, uh, I would also add that, um, that uh, uh, I'm less and less convinced that we can do only with Marx and Foucault. Uh, we need thirds. Uh, and again, I hope this is not demagogy, uh, but uh, we need thirds from the South. We need thirds from feminist uh, 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 theory. Huh? Uh, I don't say that Marx and Foucault have nothing to say to, to or cannot dialogue with feminists, but there are problems which they completely ignore. Huh? And we even need thirds, that's where I will uh, uh, bridge to, to something that uh, Emmanuel uh, uh, said. We need thirds which come from I would say the other side. Uh, already the question to uh, know, knowing on which side Marx and, uh, and Foucault find themselves today, or uh, 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 which Marx and which Foucault are on which side, is a complicated uh, 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 question. But it, when it comes, uh, uh, and I should have added already, uh, uh, we need thirds uh, uh, like uh, perhaps Latour and others uh, who uh, address the issue of uh, uh, <coughs> crossing the, the, the species barrier, uh, that's, uh, uh, which neither Foucault nor Marx, uh, Derrida had a hint of that. But, uh, but then we need thirds that come, that are or could be considered the enemy. Huh? And that's why I quote Max Weber so much. And that's why I quote Schmidt. Uh, that's, why, that's why I, I quote Schmidt both as a theorist of the uh, 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 imperial organization of the, of, the, of the world and as a theorist of uh, the intellectual conflict as such, uh, which takes me, if I still have one minute, uh, I hope this is possible, to something that Emmanuel said. I can't reply to everything, but uh, Emmanuel, you challenged me very strongly when you said, uh, can you dialogue, discuss only with friends or can you accept questions, only questions that, comes, that come from friends? Uh, how about the questions that come from the uh, that the questions that come from the enemy? And I take that very seriously. And even I'm not justifying, but I would uh, uh, be tempted to say I spoke of a kind of Machiavellian epistemology, you know, because I was going in that direction. 
But retrospectively, and with the, he the help of your question, I understand that I should go even further. Now, once again, my other master Derrida and Nietzsche behind Derrida are very good uh, uh, models uh, because what Derrida did in Politics of Friendship, and I think this is an extremely important uh, uh, book, was jumping over the head of uh, Schmidt in a sense and say, look, there's this extraordinary uh, sentence in uh, 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 Nietzsche, uh, uh, oh, uh, 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 friends, there are no friends, enemies, there are no enemies. Uh, that, is, that is showing that the relationship of the friend and the enemy is not as simple as the, the dichotomy, and you know forever where the friend is and where the enemy is. And therefore, where the idea or the, 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 the intellectual challenge has to be taken uh, 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 from. And of course, Robert Linat and I, love so much Robert Linard. thank you for quoting uh, him, at the time, uh, today, I don't know, but at the time, of course, was caught in a discourse, the Maoist discourse, uh, which had clearly and once forever established where the friend is and where the uh, uh, enemy is. Uh, now, you can translate that in many different uh, uh, terms, and they're all relevant to the contemporary situation. Uh, so I could speak about uh, applications to uh, capitalism and socialism. Uh, uh, I'm firmly convinced that we will say nothing serious and interesting about uh, uh, socialism for the, 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 the coming world if we do not return to the critique of political economy that is take seriously into account the point of view of capital itself, uh, especially if it's absolute. Uh, because capital is post-socialist in many respects, so it, ha it has introduced uh, questions and problems, human capital in, 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 in particular, which uh, 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 catch uh, the Marxist discourse uh, uh, on its weak uh, 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 side. But there are even more urgent uh, issues and they're difficult for, 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 for me because I'm this white old uh, uh, man. Huh? In, the, in, the, in the issue of race and racism to which I, I would, uh, as, as it appears uh, uh, today, uh, of course, there's a very strong dichotomy. Uh, uh, there are many people who are not easily located, but nevertheless, they are clearly dominant, uh, and uh, uh, there's a dominant system, and uh, there, there, there's a dominated uh, uh, people of racialized uh, uh, people. Now, apparently, I'm on the good side, which is the bad side, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and so I, I I I must find a way, and we must find a way to uh, 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 overcome this pure and simple dichotomy, which should not mean that we will suppress the conflict, uh, that we will find some sort of uh, 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 place uh, uh, of agreement, uh, which uh, uh, will make any of the, of the, of the concepts we, we use un unchallenged. Uh, the last thing I want to say is, after I reread my uh, collection of essays, uh, um, and that also uh, tries to answer some of your questions, so hopefully, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, I realized that there were important contemporary philosophers I had not even mentioned that, etc. Uh, and the one I would like to mention, not by chance, is Donna Haraway, because Donna Haraway invented and imposed to our attention this very important uh, 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 notion of situated knowledge. Uh, so I would say that I completely agree with the idea that there is no synoptic point of view, uh, and in that sense there is no uh, uh, ready-made universe, uni, 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 universalism. We are irremediably and, 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 and forever located both in terms of our action and in terms of our thinking within the situation itself that we are trying to make in, 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 in intelligible. That's also a difference with Spinoza. I mean, Spinoza complicated uh, he, in this respect. Uh, he was very much of a Platonist still, nevertheless, in a sense. And on the other hand, of course, Deleuze and others could read him as the perfect theorist of imminence. And therefore, of course, uh, even the third kind of knowledge, the point of view of eternity, is not 
outside the situation, the body, uh, its relations. Uh, so that's all uh, uh, going towards the idea of uh, a situated uh, 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 knowledge. I don't want to caricature Donna, but uh, uh, I, 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 I need something uh, a little more, if you, if you, if you like. Uh, so I, 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 I need the idea that we are not only located in our body, in our social uh, uh, role, in our geographic, geopolitical and geocultural uh, 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 location and, 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 and situation, but that we are uh, 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 situated and consciously uh, uh, so at the very uh, uh, place where uh, 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 concepts and ideas and theories are completely uh, uh, conflictual. So we are not overcoming the conflict, but we try to transform the conflict into uh, 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 an instrument of uh, uh, action and uh, 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 intelligibility. Okay, I'm sorry I was probably uh, uh, impossible once again. Oh, Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, H. And that was a good way of ending on the note that of Spinoza that Emmanuel just reminded us actually the importance of conceptualization and intelligibility. Uh, not do not uh, do not uh, laugh at do not uh, um, just uh, indulge in, in indignation but to understand, said intelligere, as uh, Emmanuel quoted uh, the original Latin uh, of Spinoza. I think that to, to conclude uh, where we started, uh, the discussion about how to translate interminable, the open-endedness, the interminable aspect, the unending way, and I, we, I come out of your reading your books first and having this conversation with our friends and, and you on the, your fundamental optimism. This is a very optimistic book, and I urge every, everybody should be reading it as soon as possible uh, for those who read uh, French and wait for the English translation, unfortunately, for, for the others. And I think that your book is a book of reopening. Réouverture is one of your chapters. It is, it is really the, the general sense of it at a time of awakening of socialism. Uh, this is a wonderful demonstration that although capitalism has become absolute, as I said, using your own concept, it doesn't mean that this global capitalism, this phase of global capitalism is established because it may have been, have become absolute, extractive, post-colonial, uh, 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 etc. But nevertheless, it is still not right. And maybe this is because this idea of things not being right is probably where you want still to introduce some indignari uh, going against Spinoza, saying that uh, uh, intelligere uh, yeah. goes with indignari also, the capacity to, uh, for indignation. Indignez-vous, as uh, Stefan Essel, late S. Stefan Essel said. But the whole aspect of opening, reopening possibilities and rethinking the socialism for the 21st century at the time of an awakening of socialism, as uh, Bernard uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier, is a very important uh, aspect. And that is precisely the point that Bernard is inviting us to reflect upon next week when he is the moderator of the next uh, uh, session continuing this discussion and I look forward to it and I invite everybody to, 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 to reconnect again and we will be reconvening uh, virtually in this space of reflection and friendship that you offered us, Etienne. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Etienne. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you, yes, Emmanuel. Um, thank you, an ending thank you, Bashir. Thank you, Shani. Thank you, Fanny. Thank all the invisible auditors and those who ask the two great questions on individuality. <laughs>